Welcome to our candidate forum for the runoff election for mayor of Pasadena here in city council chambers at Pasadena City Hall. I'm Paul Little, I'm the president and CEO of the Pasadena Chamber of Commerce and Civic Association. I especially want to thank our candidates, uh, Terry Tornick and Victor Gordo, for joining us here this evening um, for what is a socially distanced candidate forum. Uh, the forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters, Pasadena Area, and the Pasadena Chamber with very generous partners, Pasadena Media, who's broadcasting this over the Arroyo Channel as well as Zoom, and, uh, and the City of Pasadena, who's who are very generous to give us the room, but also the IT department, who, the Information Technology Department, uh, who have been very generous in helping us set this all up. I especially also want to thank the City Clerk's Office and the um, city manager's office for helping us with this as well. Um, I want to assure everyone that we are socially distanced and safe this evening, as I hope everyone viewing is as well. Um, before we get started, though, I do want to make a special note uh, that for the past six months, uh, healthcare workers in our city and all over the country have been working very hard to keep us all safe and healthy. And right now, here in Southern California and all up and down the West Coast, firefighters are working very hard to keep uh, the fires under control or at least try to get them under control. And so we appreciate their efforts very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other thing I want to encourage everyone to do, although you are engaged because you're watching this, is to make sure you vote in the election, either by mail or in person, uh, before November 3rd or on November 3rd. It's very important to Pasadena and the country that you participate. Um, now, if you will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please, those in the room, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to the League of Women Voters. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I end again. I would like to uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, candidate forum. Uh, uh, it's the mayoral runoff election forum. And we also thank the Pasadena media and the candidates and all who are p participating uh, in this webinar. This forum is being held in the city council chamber, as you just heard, and we are socially distanced and um, it is also being broadcast uh, on the Arroyo Channel. And in case you're interested in the Arroyo Channel, you can find it on Spectrum Channel 32 and AT&T uh, Channel 99. It's also on Fire TV and Apple TV and Roku. So we are definitely in the modern age here. My name is Dorothy Keene, and I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Pasadena area which includes Pasadena as one of the San Gabriel Valley communities that we serve. I do not live in Pasadena, so I will not be voting in this local election. I do not live, uh, excuse me. The League's charter is to promote informed and involved participation in governance through education and advocacy. We study and act on public policy issues, but never endorse or support candidates or parties. We assist in forums like this as part of our voter services program. In the November 2020 election, there are two candidates competing for the position of mayor of Pasadena. This is a term of four years. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the rest of the league team. In addition to me, we have Michelle White, who will be serving as timekeeper, and we also have Catherine Gavsey, who is serving as the question sorter. So as you send your questions in through the Q&A, uh, Catherine will be taking them and will uh, only sort them uh, for questions that are alike and any questions that are inappropriate that are attacking either candidate uh, will be discarded. The candidates will have three minutes to make an opening statement about themselves and their candidacy. The candidates will be speaking in an order based on the number that they drew. The timekeeper will keep each candidate informed of the time remaining and will raise a red card when his time has elapsed. Once a candidate's time is up, he should conclude as quickly as possible. 
The audience, again, is invited to write questions in the Q&A to be answered by the candidates. And of course, this is a webinar, so there will not be any uh, spoken questions. All of the attendees are muted and their video is off. Um, it must be, however, in the form of a question and not a statement. If there are several questions that are similar, they will be grouped together by the question sorter. Questions must deal with the issues of the election. No personal reference or attacks will be allowed. So each candidate will have two minutes to answer audience questions and will be tracked by the timekeeper. We are allowing a one, one minute to follow up on a given answer if requested. The follow-up response must focus on the question. No personal attacks are allowed. At approximately 8.15, the question period will be terminated and closing statements will begin. Each candidate will have two minutes for their closing statement. Remarks will conclude at that time and there will be no opportunity for rebuttal. Are there any questions from the candidates as to our process? Seeing, yes. Three minutes for the closing. All right, I've been, uh, I've been corrected, and we will allow three minutes for the closing statement as well. We also want to make sure that we're giving adequate time for our electorate to ask their questions via Q&A, and we have received some questions ahead of time. Uh, you were all invited to submit when you uh, signed up for the webinar, and uh, I know some more will be coming in uh, during the evening. And so we will get started now with the opening statement. Morning before one minute. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Okay, good question. Yeah. All right. So, Mr. Gordo, would you start with your opening statement, please? Thank you. I, I'd be honored to. Uh, I, I first uh, want to join Paul in thanking all of our first responders during COVID. Thank the League of, League of Women Voters and the Chamber. Thank you, all of those, all of those who voted in the primary and voted for change. I remain humbled and honored that I came in first place. I believe your support of my campaign is because you know me. You know Pasadena is home to me and not an urban planning exercise. You know that when I talked about our parks, it's because I played in them. When I talked about our schools, uh, I attended them. I led on early childhood education. When I talk about our neighborhoods, I lived in our neighborhoods. I also delivered the Pasadena Star News. When I talk about our local businesses, it's because I participated in our local businesses as a waiter uh, and in other ways. For nearly 30 years, I've committed myself to improving this community for everyone. 24 years directly in my city council district, nearly 20 years as a member of the city council. My record is clear. I listen, I build consensus, towards, and, and I work towards solving difficult issues. I do believe that I humbly am, I believe and respectfully that I am the most experienced and best qualified person to be mayor of this city. I've worked on almost twice the budget as, as my uh, opponent, capital improvement and operating budgets. I, together with my colleagues, eight years before my opponent joined the city council, prepared this city for the housing crisis, for the recession, and then wound our way through it. Public safety, I've worked hard to protect it and improve it. Affordable housing, I built, together with my neighbors and colleagues on the city council, more affordable housing in my district than any other district. And I challenge my, my opponent to tell us how many affordable units were built in his district when he was a member of the city council. Resolving bargaining unit, uh, issues, I'll tell you that I believe I've had a hand in keeping our workforce uh, contributing to us when we need, when the city needed it and helping out, but also um, treating them fairly. Accomplishments, let's go back to Ambassador College to protect West Pasadena neighborhoods. Let's talk about the NFL where I voted not once, but three times against the NFL. I had a hand in the Rose Bowl project in the convention center. Unlike my opponent, I have consistently said no to the 710 freeway uh, each and every time. Uh, and even when he voted no, uh, yes, I voted no against the freeway when he refused to. Inclusionary housing, before my opponent joined the city council in 2006, which we led the way. 
affordable housing, we've gotten rid of liquor stores and replaced it with beautiful housing. Minimum wage and measure I, I would say to you I had a hand in that was a team effort. Most recently I led up on COVID because I was here. I met with employees, I met with businesses, I demanded food uh, security, I demanded guidelines for residents and for businesses to operate safely and move about safely. I advocated for vulnerable seniors, met with small businesses, and most of this before my opponent returned from an overseas trip. I will continue to be here for all Pasadena, Pasadena residents. Thank you for your consideration. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Torner. Thank you. Uh, like everyone else, I would like to uh, thank the sponsors. Um, and I would like to thank you, people who are actually taking the time, in spite of all the challenges that we, uh, we're confronted with today, to spend the time with us this evening. Um, I think it's really a central theme for what all of us are, are dealing with right now. We have really, in spite of all the challenges, the unique challenges that are confronting us, we have to carry on. We have to do our jobs. And I think that's particularly true with regard to city government. In spite of extraordinary challenges and a combination of sort of unprecedented challenges, the city must continue to deliver customary services to its residents and also take on some new tasks that it typically has not had to take on. I think that Pasadena has performed well in this very trying set of circumstances, and I think that I've done my part as mayor. But I also think that I've been effective, not just during the pandemic, but in accomplishing what I outlined that I would uh, do when I was elected five years ago. When I ran for office, I said that I would focus on making Pasadena financially strong, I would support the PUSD, I would safeguard the environment, I would protect the quality of life in the neighborhoods, and I would reduce crime. I don't do these things by myself. Uh, this is a city council manager form of government and we all have to pull together to make it happen. But it does require leadership in terms of, of really making sure that we m remain focused on those issues that are most important. Now, because of these challenges, we are going to have enormous trials going forward. The impacts of this pandemic, the financial impacts, the personal impacts, are going to be long-lasting and very serious. We've got, we've got to restore business activity. We've got to adjust our land use regulations. There are a whole series of complicated things we're going to have to do. I believe that my performance and my training, my experience, and my, what I've demonstrated to date uh, suggest that I would be well suited to those challenges. I hope that you will give me the opportunity to continue in that service as your mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, the uh, chamber uh, has submitted a few questions and we're going to start with their questions. And the first question will be uh, answered by both candidates but we will start with Mr. Gordo. In 1994, Pasadena voters supported a general plan that required more dense development in downtown and near transit hubs while, re while reserving our neighborhoods. Are there areas where you would like to see development increased and or places you think are being restricted? Mr. Gordo. You know, the plans are just that, they're plans. They're forecast of what we believe and, and how we believe the city, the city should evolve. We have to be prepared to adjust plans. And what I've heard from people many times is we, we have to take a step back. Uh, yes, absolutely, the general plan's goal is to protect neighborhoods and, and build development where it's appropriate in the downtown. But we've seen lots of development occur uh, that, that has gone beyond what I consider to be the vision and the view of the general plan. Let's take the project at Los Robles and uh, Villa that, was recent, that recently came to the city council. Double the density, double the height, no affordable housing. I spoke out strongly uh, against that project. Um, my opponent defended the developer and the project. 
I've heard from residents say, this is the kind of development that we can't see encroaching into our neighborhoods. This is the kind of development that, that not only fails to provide affordable housing on site as we imagined and as, that, as we adopted in the inclusionary housing policy and all of our affordable housing policies, but it's development that ruins the fabric of a neighborhood, doesn't take into account the parking needs of current residents, let alone future residents, doesn't take into account the burden on, on, uh, on our infrastructure and leads to not affordable housing, but housing for people and the benefit of people who don't live here, the developers and residents who I would suggest to you uh, don't, don't, won't live there, who, who live in Pasadena already and won't be able to afford to live there. That's the kind of change and adjustment that the people of Pasadena are demanding and we should review the general plan for that reason. All right, thank you. Mr. Tornick. The 1994 general plan and its successor documents, the one we adopted a couple of years ago, uh, have had a, a, a clear theme of saying that Pasadena should have some modest growth, but we need to control that growth and make sure that it's just in the downtown area and in the areas near the gold line. I think, and at the same time, we need to protect our, our single family neighborhoods. I think that's sound planning. Uh, I think that what's happened is that and also, I should say, we've established caps on an area-by-area -area basis in terms of the total number of units that can be built there. The latest version of the general plan actually reduced the caps uh, in terms of total development of housing units and commercial square footage from the earlier version. So Pasadena's got a very clear grip on what it thinks is appropriate in terms of growth. I think what's happened is when, when it's said that uh, this activity, running for office and serving, is not an urban planning exercise. It's true, but I think that the urban planning role is critical because it means that the thousands of people that participated in developing that general plan have raised their voices in a careful and coherent way, set a blueprint for the city to follow, so that we're not confronted with a kind of case-by-case -case decision making where, where passions are raised, individuals raise their voices, and we lose sight of what the overall objectives are for our city. So I am a big believer in the general plan and, and in the planning exercise as it's been described because I think it most accurately reflects the will of the people and is most beneficial to the city in the long term. All right, thank you, Mr. Gordo. Would you like another comment on that? I would. You know, the, the, yes, the general plan was adopted, but the general plan is never set in stone. The law allows for amendments, and, and, uh, and the people who participated, well-meaning people who had a vision for Pasadena, but as the plan has evolved, we've heard from other voices, uh, including people who participated in the adoption of the general plan. Um, and we can't forget that we represent people, not plans. You know, it's not the plan at all or any cost. It's the people that we have to remember to listen to. Uh, and if we need to adjust where appropriate, uh, not losing sight of the original intent, but refining and improving the, the, general plan, the general plan in order to reach the ultimate intent of what was adopted, protecting right. neighborhoods and having reasonable growth. Thank you. Mr. Toyner, comment? Yes, I, thank you. I, uh, there's nobody that's more focused on protecting neighborhoods than, than I am. When I was planning director in 1983, I wrote the ordinance that was the, uh, uh, that gave birth to all the historic districts in Pasadena. Um, I got back into public life uh, in terms of running for the city council uh, because there were some condos built against the rear lot line of my, uh, my lot. Uh, looming, oh, not one project, but two, looming over my rear yard, and I couldn't understand how the city's regulations had been modified since I'd left the city uh, as planning director in a way that allowed that to happen. So I won't cede ground to anyone in terms of neighborhood protection or motivation, but I do think that the, the and certainly the general plan is not set in stone. It continues to evolve. But I think that, that orderly uh, process that protects the larger view of the city and the real future of the city uh, is more important than responding to a few loud voices that may be raised 
around any given project. All right, thank you very much. And now we will move uh, to the second question. And the second question was also submitted by the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I will direct it to you, Mr. Tornick. During the pandemic, Pasadena elected officials and city staff have been very supportive of our business community, especially our restaurants. Do you see the measures that are facilitating businesses reopening continuing in the future? What more can Pasadena do to support businesses once the crisis is over? I think the city has responded reasonably well. Um, there's been a lot of focus on restaurants because they play such an important part uh, in our city and adding to its vitality. Uh, and we've got a lot of them. We've got more than 600 restaurants and the national forecast uh, is that as many of a third of the existing restaurants may fail as a result of the pandemic. So clearly they are sort of at the tip of the spear, but, but I think we've got a, a much larger problem than just restaurants. I think we've got small businesses of all kinds. I've been, I had a Zoom meeting with some dry cleaners, for example, and their business nationally is off by more than 75%. Many of them won't survive. Um, and, and I think we've got all kinds of businesses that, that are gonna be shuttered as a result of the pandemic. Uh, the short form answer to your question is the city will have to continue to be engaged uh, in supporting our businesses. We need to look at our regulatory environment. We need to look at innovative programs. We need to lobby both Sacramento and Washington to make sure we get our fair share of assistance because the city's budget can't carry the whole load. Uh, but mostly we need to be engaged and make sure that we are accommodating the needs of, of the, uh, the restaurants in terms of regaining health uh, whether it means continuing to allow sidewalk dining or varying some of our regulatory uh, fee structure in a way to give them a chance to recover. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of uh, uh, blank storefronts and, and a continuing uh, hemorrhaging in terms of the revenue we collect from these businesses and people who will be out of work because they won't be able to go back to work in these businesses. So clearly the city has been engaged during the course of the, camp the uh, pandemic and we'll have to continue to be engaged in ways that we haven't traditionally been. Thank you. Mr. Gordo. You know, in, in engagement is the word, direct engagement. You know, and, and I recall in April, in March and April, when I was demanding that we not cancel meetings, uh, and our incumbent said something along the lines of, what difference will it make? Now we see the difference that it makes, why we shouldn't have canceled meetings. When, when I and others on, on the council demanded, let's schedule meetings, let's hold committee meetings, our businesses and the people of Pasadena need us now most. Uh, yet meetings were canceled. Uh, I had to write an op-ed piece. I, I, I met with businesses, restaurateurs, um, small businesses in, in order to hear directly from them. Um, and I, I demanded that we, that we put in place uh, reasonable regulations and guidelines that we think about using space differently so that they could reopen safely. Um, I, I, I made those demands because I know the pain that they were feeling. I know that they were suffering. Uh, and I went out and met with them directly. Um, and we are going to have to continue to be engaged. And we are going to have to evolve our assistance. And what I mean by that is... As recently as, as this week, I met with small business owners, including restaurateurs, uh, who are saying to me, the change is coming in the weather. Let's start talking about the regulations and how we might evolve those regulations. Heaters, for example, outdoor space in the winter and rain is different than outdoor space in the summer. Let's talk about Sacramento regulations and begin the work of ensuring that Sacramento doesn't treat this, the, some of the uh, waivers in the regulations for outdoor dining as an example, or retail as temporary. But let's start to work with our neighboring jurisdictions to lobby Sacramento to make them, to have an interim uh, plan and then a more permanent plan. 
I think the COVID crisis will change uh, how we think about space and how we think about business being conducted in the public sphere, and we should get to work on it right now. Mr. Tornick, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I, I think that the, um, the issue of, of how you can intervene effectively is, is an important one and, and how you exercise leadership. I think there was some difference of opinion about the numbers of meetings, council meetings and committee meetings that uh, uh, should have been conducted in the early stages of the, of the pandemic. It was my feeling that the city staff, which is responsible for actually engaging these regulations and the businesses most directly was really at wit's end and really extended almost beyond uh, the breaking point. And to have them spend uh, hours and hours, uh, not in this chamber any longer, but, but uh, on Zoom, uh, engaging city council members with important discussions, uh, but discussions that were pulling them away from doing their major task, which is actually getting the work done, was not the most productive use of their time. So we did limit the number of meetings. And I think that was a good allocation of, of time. Uh, that did not give short shrift to interaction with the businesses. Staff was, in fact, meeting with the businesses and having those discussions with them. I was trying not to replicate their work. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gordo, respond. Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's, I have to disagree with that. Um, the staff, yes, the staff was working, but they were focused on, in my view, uh, different issues. You'll recall that as I was requesting together with the full, the full Economic Development Technology Committee that we be allowed to meet uh, and were denied that opportunity um, because it, 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 what the planning staff was doing at the time was working on, on a planning commission meeting. Instead of meeting with the city council to talk about the needs of businesses or the city committees, the council committees, they were processing cannabis permits for companies that don't even um, exist in Pasadena. That's what was happening. And that's why I objected. And that's why I put in writing in an op-ed piece, we need to meet and take care of the city's business uh, and address the issues of our local businesses before we process cannabis permits for corporations in Las Vegas who want to come here. Let's take care of the people who are here conducting business now. All right, thank you. And now we move on to the third question that was submitted by the uh, chamber. Uh, and this uh, question is going to be uh, directed to uh, Mr. Gordo. Uh, focusing on the city's financial outlook, the pandemic has impacted finances at most businesses, in many households, and in government. What are the current fiscal realities for the city? And how would you address the financial challenges facing Pasadena? You know, another reason I was demanding that we meet is to talk about the city's finances. You know, this is a, this is a big operation, $878 million now that the city council uh, is in charge of in trust on behalf of the people of Pasadena. We've spent down our reserves, um, the 5%, the 15%, the unassigned. We've spent it, we've, we've allocated about $27 million of it. With COVID costs, it's about $32 million. The Rose Bowl, I said, is going to need help. The convention center is vacant and, and an indoor venue likely to remain vacant. So I am worried about that. I have been worried about that. I remain worried about that. Fortunately, together, uh, as a city council, we prepared for this. But that even the preparation that we made, close to $80 million in reserves, can go very quickly in a pandemic like this. Uh, I'm, concerned, I'm concerned about some of the projections. Our, our hotels, for example, are operating at about 35% capacity. Two of our major hotels, the Sheraton and uh, the Langham, remain closed. Uh, restaurants, we see how fragile they are. Retail will never be the same again. Uh, we were very, very fortunate to have a strong assessed valuation in property taxes. Um, we, were very, we are very fortunate that we have a diverse economy, but we can't let down. Um, we have to maintain focus on how the city is going to evolve locally um, through COVID and post-COVID. 
not necessarily and not just for tax purposes, but to protect, as you mentioned, Dorothy, to protect our local employees uh, and businesses, because they're the ones who ultimately will support uh, our city hall and our city workforce and the services that they provide and our residents demand and rely on. Thank you very much. Mr. Tornick. Thank you. Um, the city has in fact had a significant setback as a result of COVID. We've, um, as was referenced, we, uh, we've taken about a $30 million hit as a result of uh, reduced revenues uh, from various sources. Happily, um, we were well prepared for this, this rainy day. Um, and our reserves uh, were well over $70 million, and, and they still remain, uh, the, the major reserve component um, still remains largely intact. Uh, we have been very scrupulous about the way we've been doing our budgeting. I have devoted my State of the City message every year almost exclusively to budgetary matters and established the predicate for Measure I which uh, was a, the voters approved by a wide margin um, and has generated uh, $21 million a year, uh, seven of which we give to the school district. Uh, that $14 million was intended for uh, capital improvements and now has been repurposed for operating activity. Um, and with the exception of the Rose Bowl, which is the, the, the major um, cash uh, demand, uh, the, the unanticipated cash demand that's come out of this crisis so far to the tune of about $8 million uh, for this coming year, um, we are not in a position where we have to cut services or, or reduce our activities, but we are going to have to be mindful and we are going to have to be careful about how we spend our money, uh, what we do in terms of collective bargaining with our, with our unions. Uh, who have been very patient with us and have ex had expired contracts that they've extended working with us. Uh, but I think if we continue with, uh, with a kind of a careful fiscal policy that we've had during the past few years, uh, that we should be able to weather this storm, um, in spite of it being a big storm, in much better shape than most cities uh, will. All right, thank you. And uh, respond, Mr. Gordo? You know, the 15% the, the um, reserve, the, the bulk of the reserve, uh, as I, I believe uh, Mayor Tornick puts it, is $41.3 million. To give you an idea, in two years, if the convention center can't get back to operations, that could easily be eaten up uh, by the convention center, as well as the Rose Bowl. Um, the Rose Bowl will require uh, about $12 million if we can't reopen the stadium. Um, I, I'm hopeful, I'm hearing good things about football, uh, even the Rose Bowl game. And so we're hopeful. The Rose Bowl is uh, looking to be, think differently. But let's think about the, con uh, and, and act differently. But let's think about the convention center, indoors, conventions. Zoom has changed the world. Uh, we could have a convention center that's vacant two and three, four years from now. Let's hope not, and let's work to avoid that. I've asked that that matter come to the city council it is not. I'm looking forward to it because the convention center needs help too, and we need to protect the city's budget, short term and long term. Thank you. Respond. Yeah, I, I will say that um, the finance committee has been meeting uh, twice a month, been meeting every two weeks, looking at the existing uh, impacts, uh, projecting impacts, examining all of the uh, the components that that threaten our our fiscal health. Um, the good news is that the major source of revenue for the city comes from our real estate tax revenue, which is very solid. Uh, and the same development that has come under such close scrutiny and, and uh, is objected to by some uh, is what's generating a significant, is a tremendous driver in terms of finances for the city. So that I'm optimistic about the outcome as long as we are responsible as we have been over the past few years in terms of how we manage our finances. And I think that, uh, that our reserves will hold up. All right, thank you. And uh, now we are moving to uh, question four, and uh, this will be uh, directed to Mr. Tornick. Uh, and it has to do with policing. How will you support continued civilian oversight and the independent auditor? 
the uh, the civilian oversight um, concept that was adopted unanimously by the city council a couple of weeks ago, uh, and will be before us in term in ordinance form, I hope on on Monday, um, is really the result of uh, careful listening to uh, to what the people had to say. Um, Councilmember Kennedy and I generated a, a version of a proposal for discussion purposes. We were roundly criticized for taking the initiative to, uh, to move in such a, an expedient way. Um, but we felt that this was an issue that was so important to so many people and was so fraught for people in our city, so emotionally fraught and, and touched so many nerves that it was not one that would abide by the sort of typical um, meeting, meeting, meeting strategy. And so we had the uh, audacity to uh, actually draft a proposal that was based on work that had been done and brought to the City Council unsuccessfully uh, four years ago. Uh, so my commitment to moving civilian oversight, both the commission, the New Citizen Commission, and the independent police auditor forward uh, is well established. I'm hopeful that, that my colleagues will agree to adopt the ordinance on Monday and that we will be able to swiftly appoint the, um, the Civilian Oversight Commission and, uh, and put the uh, independent police auditor in place. As Councilmember Kennedy has said, this is a, uh, the first step in a long process, not the last step. So the, but you can be assured that I will continue to be supportive of, of moving this forward um, and I think there's a lot of interest and demand uh, for making that happen. Thank you. Mr. Joyner. Gordo. Gordo. I'm, 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 sorry. I'm so sorry, Mr. Gordo. Right. I'll answer again. We're, we're often confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because you're making me do all this back and forth. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you, I, our city, our country, I think the world has evolved on oversight. Um, and we all agree it has to be real. It has to be responsible. It has to take into account that, that there are very hard working men and women protecting us every day. Uh, but that the issue is trust. Uh, and that's what we are striving for. And on the issue of oversight, I, you know, it, it concerns me when I, and when I hear the mayor of this city say that, you know, that's an issue that's brought and therefore two members of the city council and two members alone deserve to run off and develop a policy outside of the public eye. Where do these meetings occur? Two members of the City Council of the of Public Safety Committee, Mr. Madison and Mr. Hampton, whom I have a great deal of respect for, uh, very passionate, very uh, involved, and very knowledgeable on this issue. And this issue is too fraught for their input. I, I, I reject that. I think Pasadena has a long history of working together as a council, as colleagues, and including the public input, especially on issues of trust and oversight, especially when issues are fraught um, with, uh, uh, well, fraught's the, not the word I would use, that's Mr. Tornick's word, especially when there's going to be differing views and opinions, and especially on the most sensitive, important issue in any municipality, public safety. And so I reject that. And on the issue of transparency and trust, half of our public safety committee is excluded. And what comes back to us isn't what we were, where we ended up. I rejected it, why? Because it was business as usual. It didn't have the independence that we now see, that uh, Mr. Hampton and Mr. Madison and I and others argued for initially. It didn't address the issue of trust. Now we're getting there, but we have to be measured and we have to be responsible and we have to be deliberate. But we have to do it together and with the input of the public. Mr. Tornick, respond? Yes, I, you know, that's a, it's such a gross mischaracterization that, um, that members of the council were excluded. We had three public safety committee meetings on it. The only thing that was, was somewhat different is that instead of relying on staff, uh, to do the drafting and, and do the heavy lifting on this. Um, Council Member Kennedy and I took the initiative to derive the information from, as I said, the elaborate study that had been done four years earlier and presented to the Council and said, look, here's a place to start the discussion. We can't talk about this in the abstract because we have to make this happen and we have to make it happen now. So to characterize that as a, 
uh, as a sort of a, uh, as secret meetings is, is just nonsense and does not reflect what actually happened uh, in the process. I'm proud of the process. Uh, it's, it's not one that I think would work in, in every circumstance, but given the intense interest and the emotional reaction that people were having and the fact that things like this can go down kind of a rabbit hole and disappear for months at a time meant that we couldn't conduct business as usual. And I think that's part of what leadership means. All right, thank you. Mr. Gordo. Leadership is, is bringing people together to work together. Leadership is trusting that your colleagues, um, even though you may disagree, will ultimately together come to the correct conclusion that's in the best interest of this city. Um, that's what we did on other difficult issues. It's what we've, what we've always done. When the question of whether or not we should have a health department in place, um, Mr. Madison and I and others led the charge saying, we need a health department in place. This is in 2010, 2011. Um, and we didn't come back and say, this is the Gordo Madison proposal. It went to committee and we debated it and we discussed it. We found a way to save the health department. On minimum wage, another controversial subject, it went to the EdTech committee that I chaired, Mr. Madison, Mr. Hampton, Mr. Wilson. We didn't come back and say, this is the Gordo Wilson, um, Madison and uh, Hampton proposal. This is the proposal that our community debated and came up, came up with and, and presented to the full council and, the, and to the community in public debate and discourse. And we came up with solutions together. All right, thank you. All right, now we are moving to another question. Uh, and this one is going to be uh, directed to Mr. Gordo. Am I right on that? Yes. <laughs> keep, me, keep me honest up here. The county has placed Measure J on the November 2020 ballot. Pursuant to this measure, up to 10% of the locally generated unrestricted county money would be diverted to meet community needs and alternatives to policing. Do you support diverting a portion of the city police budget to fund mental health and other services that are better provided by other agencies rather than the police. Do you support Measure J? You know, I, I, I think, you know, we, we're all elected to make difficult decisions um, and to debate those decisions in public. Um, I recall when uh, people entertained the possibility of getting rid of police helicopters. I said, you know, that involves public safety, that involves uh, officer safety. Um, we can't do it. This, this notion of defunding the police started long ago. Uh, and I said, we can't do it. We should think of ways to deliver services differently. I advocated for civilians to be in our parks so that police, police officer resources could be freed up. I advocated for park safety specialists um, to, to fulfill that role, and it was rejected. Um, I advocated uh, by my opponent and others. Um, I advocated for us to bring the NAC team back, the, the neighborhood action team, to build relations in the community. And it was a struggle, but our police chief uh, finally made it happen. Um, I don't support budgeting by legislation. I support working together to debate matters, um, to ensure that, to debate matters publicly, um, to ensure that every, everyone's voice is heard. I believe that we can do a better job with the resources we have in every department, in human services. Um, I think, and I've asked long before this crisis started, um, more than a year ago, I asked to review department by department how we were using resources, including the police department, and whether we could be more efficient and effective. Um, I raised that long, probably a year and a half or two years ago. Uh, we, got, we did get through two departments, but that was it. We didn't schedule those meetings. And so here we are continuing to have the discussion about the effective and efficient use of resources. We shouldn't limit it to one department. We should look at all departments. But I cannot support doing it by legislation with a broad sweep because that's not thoughtful. It does, it's not inclusive of everyone's voice. Um, and it could cause problems. All right, thank you. Mr. Tornier. 
One of the things that we've been talking about, first let me say that the, the idea of defunding the police department was, I think, a misapplied term, and, and uh, even the advocates have now kind of described that as reimagining the police department rather than defunding it. Um, but when that, when that issue arose and it began to get such intense scrutiny, uh, one of the things that we did was we brought, we had the staff bring to the finance committee a breakdown of how the city is spending all of its resources. Um, not just the police department, but all the departments. And so you can begin to aggregate the amount of money that's being spent on public safety as opposed to sort of human related, human resources related activities. And there were some surprising results to that. People were a little bit surprised when they saw the totality of expenditures of, of all city funds, not just the general fund, uh, in terms of how those dollars are allocated. We then had further discussion about uh, at, the, um, at the Finance Committee and now at the Public Safety Committee, um, more specific to the police department. So this discussion is, is evolving uh, very thoroughly and carefully in terms of how we allocate our resources and how services are provided by the police department and whether any of those services might be more appropriately provided uh, by other departments or at least not by sworn officers. Uh, I don't think that a straight percentage allocation, uh, apart from saying that it's aspirational, is a good way to do budgeting. I think it's a dangerous way to proceed. I haven't studied Measure J in detail, although I will before I vote, uh, but I think the idea of just sort of arbitrarily saying we're going to allocate these dollars uh, in a fixed way has led to uh, serious budgetary problems for other entities, both at the state level and, and the county level before. All right, uh, Mr. Goder, do you care to comment? I, I do, and let, 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 we should, you know, I, I should add that besides looking at the city's uh, use of existing resources in every department, um, we should also question the county. Remember, we have, we do have our own health department, but mental health services, as an example, and that's the example that we was used in the question, uh, is mostly the purview of the county. We rely on those county services. And I can't tell you how many times I've asked at this dais that we bring the county health department here to answer our questions, and it's not been agendized. I can't tell you how many times I've said, let's bring the director of mental health, let's bring uh, our supervisor in, and let's ask, where are the portals for mental health, the portals to entry for services, for mental health services uh, in, in Pasadena? as should be provided by the county. Um, and we need to, besides hold our own feet to the fire on, on the responsible use of resources, also hold the county's feet to the fire on the responsible use of resources in this city, including mental health. All right, Mr. Tornick. I think that the uh, relationship with the county is a vital one. Um, and in fact, the hope teams that we have, which is a combination of specially trained police officers and uh, non-sworn uh, social worker mental health experts is a joint venture with the county. So I think that model is well established. Um, I've been uh, talking a lot, particularly during the pandemic, about mental health issues because I feel that they are becoming, it's a very intense problem during the course of the pandemic. And in fact, I recorded a PSA last week where I urged people to and gave them the website information on where to go both for county resources and city resources as it relates to mental health. So I quite agree that the, uh, the issue um, transcends just the city budget, but I think that we can do a better job in terms of making sure that the way we allocate our own $800 million total budget um, between and among the various services is, is more readily understood by the public and that they are supportive of the way we are allocating our dollars. All right, thank you. All right, and the uh, next question uh, will be directed to Mr. Tornick. Uh, it is, uh, tenants constitute 57% of Pasadena's residents. According to city planners, more than half of Pasadena's tenants are rent burdened, paying more than 30% of their income on housing, and 27% of them spend more than 50% of their income on housing. What is your stance on rent control for Pasadena? And how would you address housing security for Pasadena's renters? I think the city has been um, 
really a model in some ways of, of how we've attempted to uh, deal with the affordable housing shortfall uh, in our city. This is obviously a, a regional problem, a Southern California problem. Um, but we have been very active in terms of, of designing programs and doing activities that will uh, enhance the availability of affordable housing. Um, I have a personal record in terms of having participated as a volunteer for Pasadena Neighborhood Housing Services for nearly 20 years, uh, which was the major affordable housing nonprofit in Northwest Pasadena. And then I served on the board of Link Housing, uh, which is a statewide effort and has built five or 6,000 units across the state. So I'm very conversant with the available resources and how you can manage that. Pasadena, through its inclusionary ordinance, which requires that 20% of any new project be devoted to affordable housing, um, and the other uh, actively pursuing and working with nonprofits uh, to, to develop additional affordable housing, uh, has been doing a, a, a pretty good job in that area. Can we, feed, can we avoid uh, the, the shortfall? Absolutely not. But I don't support rent control because the evidence is pretty clear uh, that rent control deters the production of additional housing, which exacerbates the problem, and also discourages people from maintaining existing housing. So it's a, it's a kind of a, um, an easy fix that people think will solve the problem when in fact I think it will make it worse. We have to, we have to do our best um, to uh, produce more affordable housing, to build them on city-owned sites, to build them on uh, church-owned available property, to build them on school sites. We're continuing to build them at the Civic Center, uh, which is a proposal that there's a hearing on uh, on Tuesday. Um, I think we need to produce more housing, not, not have rent control. All right, Mr. Gordo. You know, I, I, I've watched rent control uh, fail in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Santa Monica, um, some of the most expensive markets. And so this is probably one area where uh, Mr. Tornick and I uh, agree on. But we do have to recognize the fact that, that uh, renters are hurting. And I, and I think starting in 2006 with the inclusionary housing ordinance, uh, before um, uh, Mayor Tornick joined the council, some of us in this room worked on that. Um, some of us in this room have worked together to get rid of liquor stores and replace it with affordable housing. Um, some of us in this room understand the need. Uh, I'm surprised uh, that Mayor Tornick says it's, it recognizes now it's a regional in Southern California issue uh, because that's what I argued um, at the housing forum in the primary that we need to work with the San Gabriel Count Valley Council of Governments. Uh, and instead of the, what I consider to be lack of leadership pulled us out. 31 cities in the San Gabriel Valley now are participating in a housing trust uh, to create more affordable housing for the region, uh, to leverage local resources. 31 cities in the San Gabriel Valley, San Gabriel Council of Governments, but there are only 30 members. Pasadena is not there working with its neighbors. At the housing forum, some of you will recall the answer that Mayor Tornick gave that should never be said by any mayor of Pasadena uh, is those cities are smaller than us, they're not relevant. I reject that and I believe that we need to get back to addressing the issue of housing on a regional basis uh, together with our neighbors, leveraging local resources to bring more um, federal and state resources as they are doing today without Pasadena. And Pasadena is not at the table and doesn't benefit from that. Uh, lobbying Sacramento, lobbying uh, Washington, D.C. I believe our neighbors are relevant, and now we're seeing why. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tornick, do you care to comment? Yes, I think one of the answers to uh, producing more affordable housing in Pasadena is not throwing in with the uh, San Gabriel uh, Valley COG, which has had a traditional uh, failure and lack of interest in affordable housing of all kinds. Uh, I think it's the very last group that we would want to join with. The trust um, has, has yet to produce any significant results. Pasadena is in much better shape in terms of, they look to us in terms of how we do things rather than us joining them. The trust is, a, is another illustration of the COGS abdicating its responsibility with regard to uh, producing housing. Um, and I think this is, this is another one of those red herrings that somehow joining communities that have traditionally objected to the producing of multifamily housing in general and affordable housing in particular, 
uh, would somehow benefit the city of Pasadena. Uh, these are cities, many of them, that objected even to the Operation Room Key in terms of taking care of homeless people during the pandemic. I don't think that this is necessarily a group that we want to rejoin. All right, and Mr. Gordo? I, I would invite everyone to visit the COGS. These are our neighbors, <laughs> neighboring cities, over 2 million people. I would visit, invite everyone to visit the, the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments uh, website. The trust was just put together in the last eight, eight to 10 months, um, the housing trust. Um, and I and our neighbor Arcadia, Monrovia are members of the housing trust. Pasadena is not. Um, how, you know, Pasadena has historically led. We should be leading. And then it's absolutely true that other cities look to us as leaders. Um, and it's absolutely true that they should, uh, because we are. This is the greatest city, not just in the valley, but I would say to you, uh, in the universe, we are leaders. Uh, and we should be united as a city, come together, work together to, to improve uh, affordable housing for all, uh, but also as a region. Uh, and, I, and I say Pasadena will do that. All right, thank you. And the next question is going to be uh, directed to Mr. Gordo. And I have uh, three questions and I'm gonna try to just summarize them into one. Uh, what citywide system will you introduce to help keep Pasadena residents informed and able to respond to COVID, to fires, and to other emergencies, and particularly the Bobcat fire? Mr. Gordo. Repeat the question? Please. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> What citywide system will you introduce to help keep Pasadena residents informed and able to respond to COVID, to fires, particularly the Bobcat, and to other emergencies? You know, the, 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 again, the, going back to working with our neighbors, uh, COVID, uh, the Bobcat fire has affected everyone in this region. Uh, and I think we need to have better regional communication, not just among the cities and, and the residents, uh, mayors and city managers, and we need, that's another reason for us to rejoin uh, our neighbors in the work of homelessness, in the work of uh, affordable housing, in the work of transportation and traffic and development, but also for moments of crisis, moments like, that, like we're experiencing now, to better improve our ability to communicate um, with residents uh, as a region. Um, because we're all in this together. Um, you know, we are the crown of the valley, uh, but there are a lot of other people around us. Uh, and so the, the systems that we have, first off in Pasadena, uh, we need to do a better job of making, it, making those systems known to residents and ensure that they sign up. But let's also, as we do with police and fire communication systems, um, where our radios and communications are to be um, coordinated, let's also have a communication system with our neighbors, with Monrovia, Sierra Madre, uh, Altadena, uh, La Cañada, and beyond uh, Monrovia, uh, Brentwood, all of the cities in our region to have a better regional communication system uh, that communicates directly with residents, not just with our first responders. All right, thank you. Mr. Tornick. Yeah, I think that um, there, there is a, uh, an information shortfall in terms of being able to communicate effectively um, with our residents. Uh, I know I've been recording every week, I record an announcement uh, updating uh, that's, that's broadcast over the same channels that some of you are watching tonight that tries to broadcast information to our residents in terms of updates on COVID. Um, with regard to, that's a longer term problem that requires uh, periodic updates. And so I've been, been trying, and so the city uh, public information officer uses social media. Um, the social media presence has been beefed up uh, in the city. And we also have, but when you get, when you get to a, a real uh, emergency, a short term and intense emergency, we have systems in place called Nixle and Please, P-L-E-A-S. 
uh, and we've been urging people, there, there are tens of thousands of people signed up for those systems that do put out announcements to the, uh, to the public when there is an emergency. Um, sometimes the announcements cover too, too broad an area. So that the announcement that had people, uh, to ask people to be aware and get ready covered a part of Pasadena that really wasn't even remotely uh, uh, threatened by the Bobcat fire. So there needs to be some fine tuning. But there are systems, and this is a great opportunity to urge the viewers tonight to sign up for PLEAS, go to the fire department's uh, website in the city of Pasadena and sign up for that so that when there is an emergency, they will be notified uh, and, and we can do a better job. All right, thank you. Comment, Mr. Gordo? No, we, we can do a better job uh, in Pasadena, I agree. Um, you know, the short PSAs uh, viewed by a couple hundred people, th that's not going to do it. Um, we have to uh, affirmatively um, invite people to participate in Nixel and please. Uh, but again, um, let's see how we can do better uh, at refining our own systems uh, and do what we believe, uh, what, what we know can work, uh, working with our neighbors. All right. Yeah, I certainly don't re reject the idea of working with our neighbors. We, uh, as Councilmember Gordo knows, we have uh, mutual aid relationships on the on the public safety level. We have a joint uh, communication systems with with uh, um, with Glendale and Burbank. In fact, the neighbors that we work with most effectively and are probably most appropriate for close connections in a variety of areas, including some that have been referenced earlier are not so much the San Gabriel Valley, I think, but rather the, the emerging relationships with Burbank and Glendale um, that are, have the closest affinity with the city and, and have the most to share. Uh, and beyond that, we, we have a, a, a new joint powers authority, which involves um, uh, the Arroyo Verdugo, JPA, which includes Pasadena, Glendale, Burbank, La Cañada, and South Pasadena which we have very close coordination with in terms of transportation. And I think over time, that will be the logical sort of intercity relationship that I would like to see evolve. Okay, thank you. No question, but we can do, we can do both. And Mayor Tornick, if our neighbors to the east, to the west and to the south are relevant, I say to you that all of our neighbors uh, to the east and to the south and to the north are too relevant. Um, we can do both. Uh, and we should do both. Thank you. There have been several uh, questions on uh, the following topic. The City Council provides the ultimate oversight of the Pasadena Police Department. Do you support council members receiving financial support from the Pasadena Police Officers Association? And if you care to share, do you ex have you accepted money? Oh, and sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Tornick. Uh, I, have, I have never accepted um, contributions from uh, any employee union, um, not because it's forbidden, but, but because I've always felt there was a potential of a, at least the appearance of a conflict of interest. If we're voting on the contracts of, of, uh, of an employee union uh, to accept, um, to accept uh, contributions, political contributions from them, uh, wouldn't you know necessarily uh, taint uh, my votes on any of that. But I felt the appearance of it made me uncomfortable. So I've never accepted, um, not just from the the police union, but from the fire union or any other municipal employee union. But I think that, in fairness, um, I think more has been made of this than than is um, is really fair. Um, I think the whole area of of um, campaign finance is, uh, I'll use the word again, fraught, um, because it's, uh, there is no, you know, that's why there have been discussions about public financing to sort of eliminate it as an issue. But whether you take money from an employee union or, or anybody else, there'll always be the question of whether that results in uh, inappropriate influence peddling. Uh, and there have been some scandals in Los Angeles and elsewhere that, that uh, relate to other kinds of uh, campaign contributions. Um, so I think it, it's a little bit uh, unfair to single out a single entity and suggest that because you accept money uh, from them that somehow that would influence your ability to uh, make a decision 
uh, that was in the best interests of the of the community. Thank you, Mr. Tornick. No, Mr. Gordo. Mr. Gordo. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Gordo. I'm um, looking at his name and looking at yeah. you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, you know, the, the, the Police Officers Association did contribute to one of my campaigns in 2017. They did not contribute to my, uh, to my uh, mayoral election. Uh, and I don't recall them ever uh, contributing prior to any prior election um, that I've been involved in. Um, so, you know, but look, I, I'm, I'm proud to have the support of our firefighters, for example, um, because they pool their money together uh, to ensure that our government is well run, to ensure that we elect people who care about training, who care about services, who care about uh, uh, their, their own safety and the equipment that they, they need. Um, these are hardworking men and women that pool their dollars um, to, uh, to contribute to, the can to candidates that they believe in. And I'm proud to have their support. Um, I, I, you know, I do the, 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 the scandal in Los Angeles that Mayor Tornick is talking about involved development and development money. Um, people who are out profiting and changing the fabric of cities physically uh, and, uh, and, and increasing the price of housing everywhere. Um, and I have pledged not to accept uh, their dollars. They often come from one person uh, or, you know, people who have voted, who have had projects supported uh, or who have, who hope to have projects supported. Um, I think there we need some uh, changes and some reform. Um, and we should look at the whole question of contributions and we should look at the whole question of campaign finance. Uh, I think those are important questions to have. Um, but I'm always leery of, uh, of, of not having transparency in who is contributing. Um, I'm, we're fortunate in passing that we have a Taxpayer Protection Act um, and we have uh, full sunshine on all of the contributions and people should look those up. People should see who is uh, contributing to various and all campaigns. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tornier, a comment? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Are we finished with that one? Okay. Great. All right. Uh, the, 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 we've had several questions about the environment, and this one is, uh, how safe is Pasadena tap water, and what are our water sources, and how much are they affected by microplastic particles. That's checking your science knowledge here. <laughs> so we start with you, Mr. Gordo. Yeah. Yes. We start with you. Okay. You know, the, the issue of water and uh, the quality of water is an important one. Um, not to belabor the point, but uh, that's also an issue that's important to the entire uh, region and to the entire basin that we're a part of. Uh, water is an issue that uh, all of the cities uh, to uh, that that uh, that we that we turned away from and said weren't relevant uh, over my objection. Um, that's an issue that they all work together on. That's one of the issues that the cog handles water um, and goes to Sacramento and and, and uh, debates um, and that's appropriate. Water in Pasadena is safe. Um, we should always, we, we test. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to try and recall the level of particles uh, that are in our water, but I can tell you that, that we've had very, very robust discussions about particles and water and changes at the city council level and changes in uh, standards at the federal and regional and state level. Um, this, is, this is an issue that uh, that the council does through its municipal services committee, uh, of which I'm not a member, um, does pay close attention to. Uh, we should continue to monitor, particularly because, you know, we do have JPL, um, and uh, there has been some history there in terms of plumes um, and plumes infecting our water table, and so we should never let our guard down on testing. We should hold. Uh, every agency, federal, state, and local accountable. 
including, by the way, the, uh, the county uh, who is responsible for uh, part of the watershed. Water is a very, very complicated issue uh, because it involves local, uh, uh, county, state, and federal um, jurisdiction. All right, thank you. And Mr. Tornick. Yes, uh, we're back to the COG again. I, I will tell you that uh, I attended COG meetings for eight years on behalf of the city. Um, water is not one of their areas of, uh, of heavy expertise. Uh, there's minimal cooperation. Um, most of the water-related policies are established by the individual water districts. Pasadena gets 60% of our water remotely, that is to say from, uh, from up north, from the Delta, and from the Colorado River. And 40% of our water comes from uh, local wells. Uh, most of the concern has focused on the uh, local well production and, and the uh, intrusion from JPL plumes and other contaminating sources. Uh, Pasadena does its own testing, uh, which is then verified uh, outside. We publish an annual report, which lists in mind-numbing detail all of the uh, uh, all of the standards, and even in some categories, the federal government hasn't established standards. They have uh, suggestions in terms of, of a sort of aspirational goals. Uh, so that information is readily available. Uh, as to the issue of microplastics, that has not been the focus of a great deal of attention to date, although the questioner is very sophisticated. That is an emerging uh, issue. Uh, there is not a standard, to my knowledge, there, but, but be assured that Pasadena uh, spends a lot of time and effort making sure that we comply with all standards and we do publish that information so it is, it is a very available and, and we try to make it as understandable uh, as possible. Um, and I think that uh, it, it is one of the important services that the city, having our own water and power department, is one of the things that really makes Pasadena uh, a terrific city. Okay, thank you. Would you care to comment, Mr. Gordo? I think it's hard to comment on what the COG uh, finds um, um, as, a, as an important issue when we're not there. And, and I think we're, we're sidestepping that point. We need to be there. And if they're not focused on it, then we ought to focus them on it. Because that, well, if they're not sufficiently focused, as Mayor Tornick seems to believe, um, I, I disagree, um, then we ought to be there. That's why Pasadena should be leading again. Um, the issue of standards changing all the time, microplastics, is, that's correct. That's a, an evolving issue, uh, appropriate uh, for us to have our own water and power department. I recall when people uh, wanted us to turn the utility over uh, to private uh, operators. Uh, and I recall uh, Mr. Little, who's in this room, and, and others uh, being a part of that uh, question. I think Pasadena made absolutely the correct choice to control its own destiny uh, and keep the utility so that we can control water and power in Pasadena, and we should continue to do that. Mr. Tornick, do you want to? A small point, the, uh, the, I don't think there was ever a suggestion about privatizing the uh, water part of the enterprise. It was really focused on the, the power side. Um, I don't think anybody ever suggested that Pasadena should sell its, its, uh, the water side of the house. But I do think that um, there are some bright uh, things ahead with regard to what we're doing with water conservation. One of the things I, I do is I serve on behalf of the city on the county sanitation district. Uh, they have a joint project with the, um, uh, to develop recycled water. And the city itself is beginning to examine various um, uh, methods of how we might be able to retain water uh, recycle it and uh, use it for irrigation so we don't have to use potable water for, uh, for irrigation purposes and, and particularly on things like the golf course and around the road in Brookside Park. Uh, if we can save potable water by using recycled water through technology, that would really, really be a breakthrough and it's something that we're working hard on. Okay. I, I, I did not mean to imply privatization involved both sides of the house. That's why I said um, to, so we could control our own destiny on water and power. Um, it, was, it was involving the utility in the, on the power side. Uh, and I'm glad we reject it. And today we control water and power. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, the next question is uh, going to be uh, referred to uh, you, Mr. Tornick, first. The Arroyo Seco has been referred to as Pasadena Central Park. What is your vision for the Arroyo Seco from the South Pasadena border past Hahamanga? I hope I didn't murder the no, name no, of that, that was, area. No, no, that was right. That was right. Uh, good job. No, um, this has been one of the uh, the really key portions of of, um, of what I've att attempted to get after as as mayor. Um, I believe that the Arroyo Seco is a resource that's uh, that's um, unequaled. Um, it, it's I call it the beating green heart of of Pasadena. It's it's much bigger than Central Park. Um, and I think that it is a remarkable place that, that in many ways is being uh, loved to death. There are so many different activities happening in the Arroyo Seco um, that um, it, it really almost can't sustain all the activity that, that it's being applied for. And people know the Arroyo Seco in different ways. They view it through the lens of the way they use it. So if you're a bicyclist, you know it in one way. If you're a a frisbee golfer, you know, in another way, and if you're a, a Rose Bowl football fan, you, you know it in yet another way. They all have to coexist in this in this wonderful resource, and so I uh, urge the creation of um, of the uh, of a foundation, a private foundation, to help marshal additional resources and focus on the Arroyo. That group um, is is uh, underway now. They they are out with their uh, preparing for their first proposed demonstration project, which will go through the normal city review procedures. And I'm hoping that over time, they can begin to play a role in terms of engaging people, both in terms of participation and in terms of funding um, improvements for the Arroyo. The Arroyo is unique because it has so many different aspects from very kind of wild areas uh, up in Hahamanga uh, to very intensely used areas uh, in the central Arroyo near the, near the Rose Bowl. It has a casting pond, it has an archery range. I mean, it's got anything you can almost imagine. And so it's one of our key resources and has been one of the, it's one of the reasons I'm running for re-election is to try and uh, make sure that, that that effort that we've launched uh, really gets well established. All right, thank you, Mr. Torney. Mr. Arroyo. <laughs> Mr. Arroyo, Mr. I'll take Gordon. Mr. Arroyo. I'll take Mr. Arroyo. That's not fair. <laughs> the only thing I won't call you is Mr. Hamanga. Right. No, leave that out, so, but I'll take sorry, Arroyo. Sorry, Mr. Gordo. I'll, Gordo, go I'll ahead. take Arroyo on this question. So, you know, the, the, you know, the Arroyo has been, well, number one, the Arroyo is one of our greatest assets. It's the greatest public space. I mean, if people think about it, the Arroyo and the, the expanse of the Arroyo, uh, and you imagine it in your mind's eye, there is nothing like it in our region. There's nothing like it, I would say to you, in, in Southern California. Uh, it's special, um, and we should protect it, and we should rehab it. Um, and the, the foundation that Mayor Tornick describes did not start with one person. In fact, uh, Mayor Tornick, you'll recall that I, I said to you, we have to do something in the Arroyo to coordinate, uh, to be responsive to the needs and, and uh, Daryl Dunn, the general manager of the Rose Bowl, said, let's go visit Central Park. And I said, I'll go, and, and other yeah. great spaces. I'll go, but we need to bring uh, the mayor of the city and the city manager. And that's where the idea was born. Um, when I asked uh, Mayor uh, Tornick and the city manager to come along on that trip uh, so that we could work on improving the Arroyo together. Uh, we came back, uh, there was a committee appointed uh, that then, um, uh, grew the foundation. Those are the facts. Uh, we did it together, uh, and uh, and now we make we need to ensure that that group works. I'm proud of the fact that the two leaders of that group, of that foundation, um, are uh, Mayor Bill Bogard and Doug Cramwinkle, who are uh, both uh, uh, working very hard on my campaign. Uh, they know the history of that group. They know the importance of protecting the Arroyo. They know the importance of coordinating activity in the Arroyo uh, so that we don't overburden that important space, uh, so that it's a space that's available, that's natural for Pasadenans. Um, and yes, uh, you know, people from the region come and enjoy it also. More reason to have better coordination in the Arroyo and to have a private group raising money 
to rehab the oil. Thank you, Mr. Torner. Reply? No reply? Fine. All right, we'll move on to another question then. And this question is first going to be uh, addressed to uh, Mr. Gordo. Northwest Pasadena is undergoing gentrification and many lower income families are being permanently displaced out of the city. What is your position on locating additional affordable housing in this area of the city? And please state your reason. You know, the, the you know, Michelle who's sitting in the room with us uh, knows the, the, the history on gentrification in Pasadena and how complicated an issue it's been. Um, you know, people invest in their homes and then they sell it and other people move in. You can't go to the seller and say don't sell. You can't go to the buyer and say don't buy. Um, and so we have to do a, more, a better job of, pro of providing additional affordable housing. And I've been at this issue uh, for, for the, since I was elected to the city council. I supported Granny Flats, uh, Michelle, when, when others uh, did not. Um, and I called for a, a, second, a better second unit ordinance. Uh, we sought about uh, replacing uh, dilapidated, burned out buildings and liquor stores, uh, a burned out building on Hudson and replaced it with affordable housing, Hudson Oaks, uh, a former nursery and replaced it with affordable housing, liquor stores that attracted, uh, that attracted, that were a nuisance, the entire uh, neighborhood and city and replaced them with affordable housing. Um, the HHP ha project on Fair Oaks transformed the entirety of Fair Oaks uh, coming north from the freeway and rehab beautiful homes. Um, I think uh, the, the battle against gentrification is providing more opportunity for people to have affordable housing. We can do it strategically uh, by looking at properties that are in, in need of development, in need of investment, and then working with partners to do just that. And I have a 20 year history of accomplishment in that area. And I'm going to take it uh, with my colleagues uh, uh, further um, citywide. There are other properties citywide that could use the same look. All right, thank you, Mr. Tornick. I think that um there has been uh, some confusion about um, over-concentration of uh, affordable housing. And I think that, that um, while it is absolutely critical that there be um, affordable housing distributed throughout the city, uh, that the idea that somehow Northwest Pasadena has absorbed its, um, its limit um, is, is misplaced. I think particularly because the nature of affordable housing has changed over the years from large, uh, dense developments to smaller, um, for the most part, smaller developments or portions of, of market rate developments, that the idea that um, Northwest Pasadena has had its limit and, and we should discourage uh, the construction of any more um, uh, affordable housing in Northwest is misplaced. Um, so I think that because gentrification is raging uh, in Northwest Pasadena, uh, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that if we if there's a way of, of retaining people in the neighborhood they grow up they grew up in uh, and where they they have institutions that they rely on, we should do everything everything we can to uh, to make that possible. Thank you. Yes. No one is saying that any part of the city has reached a limit. But it, it, w what people are saying is, you know, we have a city policy, the inclusionary housing policy that says affordable housing should occur naturally as development occurs throughout the city. Um, there are some neighborhoods where people have said, you know, within uh, three or four blocks, there are large um, uh, developments, um, and that's nobody's saying there that north any part of the city has reached its limit. Um, what people are saying is let's be let's be thoughtful about it. Um, people in our city uh, deserve the right to live in every part of our city because they've grown up here. They you know they love this city. 
um, and no one should be limited to any one part of this city. Um, and so, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, having said that, that's why I was so offended by the project at Los Robles in Villa uh, that had zero affordable housing, um, zero affordable housing. Um, and that's why I spoke out so strongly against it. Mr. Turner. Well, I think the example, the delays that, that were um, associated with the completion of the development planning for Heritage Square South were an example of, of how, I think, a misguided um, application of over-concentration really delayed a, a project that, that could have been underway um, quite a bit earlier. And I think the illustration of the, um, the, 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 the preliminary, the most preliminary um, submittal on that Los Robles project at Villa. Um, that's a project that deserves careful scrutiny, is probably too dense, um, but the fact that we allow uh, projects to be built uh, off-site frees up funding to achieve greater distribution of, uh, of affordable housing. I have an affordable housing project on California around the corner from my house in, in District 7 uh, that was a result of an off-site development of affordable housing as part of a larger project. So it is a strategy that can bear fruit. All right. Thank you. All right. And the next question is uh, dealing with the environment. And uh, it's going to be directed first uh, to Mr. Tornick. The drought has strained our water company and climate change has impacted our electric usage. What can our utilities do to create more homegrown water and electricity resources? Well, the homegrown water um, issue is one that I referenced earlier. We are now in the process of developing some, I, I do serve on the Municipal Services Committee and, and uh, our water people are, are working hard and developing strategies of of recapturing wastewater, uh, particularly um, storm runoff, uh, to be recycled and reused, which is effectively like producing water. I mean, that is a, that is a, a perfect example. Um, in terms of the electric grid, uh, you know, we've, we've seen the limitations that are imposed when, when we are confronted with these overload conditions, these super hot conditions, which are no longer as novel as they once were. Um, and Pasadena has uh, enough capacity, um, homegrown capacity on Glen Arm to be able to meet our needs. We've been uh, very uh, smart in terms of how we've combined uh, resources and, and retained um, on-site uh, gas-fired uh, capacity for emergency short-term use. But I do think that um, there, and the, the committee has been urging staff to move faster in terms of examining um, a more aggressive use of storage, uh, electric storage, so that we can uh, save energy and surplus production periods and retain it for the four or eight hours that the, uh, that the technology now allows uh, and allow us to um, not be as reliant on this giant grid, which is now an interstate grid, uh, that sometimes can get overloaded and leave us in the condition of having to uh, to experience the kind of uh, short, happily, brownouts that we uh, that we did a couple of weeks ago. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gordo. So let me start um, with with uh, electricity and, and renewables. You know, the the state uh, is uh, had set the goal of 33 percent by 2020. Pasadena was the head of the curve, and we said 60 percent renewables by 2020 in our portfolio is my recollection, um, but we, sh we can and should do more. Um, but we have to balance that with uh, the cost to the end user, to the residents of Pasadena, including those who live on fixed incomes and can't afford uh, a sudden spike in, in their bill. Um, and so we, we should continue that conversation and municipal services committee, the full committee is absolutely the, the place to have that discussion uh, and then the city council. Uh, in terms of recharging the basin, absolutely. Uh, we are participating in that and we should encourage every uh, city who is a part of the basin area to do the same thing, uh, including the county of Los Angeles um, uh, that uh, represents some of the area. 
Um, we should work with the municipal water district. We should work with anyone and everyone who, uh, who shares that goal with us uh, to recharge the basin. Um, ultimately, that's good for all of us. Um, but you know, this is, this is one of those areas that also has crossover with development and development capacity. This is one of the reasons why I've suggested that we challenge the state in their imposition of you know, their new RENA numbers and, and uh, their imposition of more development. I'm sorry. Uh, the sound failed and uh, they asked us to hold off for a minute. <coughs> okay. So my, 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 again, my answer is we're charging the basin absolutely. We should, we should do that. Um, working with uh, the county, the, uh, the uh, cities around, 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 c
public safety. Uh, it means also to me um, people who are less fortunate, uh, homelessness, people who can't afford to uh, make ends meet, um, we need to protect. Uh, but it also means to me th that we need to support uh, our local small businesses and our businesses in general because ultimately they're the ones who employ the people that we're seeking to protect. Um, you know, I grew up in a garage uh, for a part of my life before my parents were able to achieve the American dream and buy a house. Um, and so what I know what it's like, uh, you know, to work in restaurants. My father retired from the same restaurant uh, in East Pasadena after 50 years at that same restaurant. Um, and so most important to me are the issues facing the health issues, the economic issues, uh, the housing issues, the public safety issues. Uh, that are facing the residents and the businesses and, and the business owners and families and individuals in the city of Pasadena. Uh, my vision is that we get back to working together as a city. Um, and I was very proud to have the support of people throughout this city uh, in the primary. Uh, and I know that we're ready to work together as a city, uh, then work together as a city council uh, and then work together with our neighbors in the region to improve the quality of life in Pasadena uh, and for all residents of Pasadena. All right, Mr. Tornick. Yeah, I, you know, I think that um, sitting in the mayor's office, which I haven't been able to do for a while, um, actually, uh, but electronically, I still get the same uh, information. Um, you're confronted with a series of, of uh, good ideas coming from the public. People have um, a series of ways that we can improve the way we run the city, uh, things that we should be doing that we're not doing, or things that we are doing that we could be doing better. Um, and I, I'm frequently um, really amazed at the, at the ingenuity and the, um, uh, the clarity that people have about what's really important. And one of the things that I've realized early on, and part of it comes from the fact that I was a department head in the city and, and then went out into, into, uh, into the business world um, to make a living. And um, I realized that if you haven't got the resources, if you haven't got the financial strength, um, you, you can't do any of it. You can't implement any of these good ideas. So in terms of the most pressing problem, the single thing that that is a sort of a, a, a North Star for me is that we have to make sure that the city remains financially strong. If we don't have the ability to do that, if we're not generating revenues, if we're not doing effective management to control the expense side, uh, we can't do any of the great things that people would like us to do. So, um, you know, I worked very hard at that during my five years as mayor. Uh, I need to continue to do that, and that challenge is even greater now uh, because of the uh, the inroads made and the, and the challenges on both sides of the equation, demands for more services and a reduction in revenue that, that uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has imposed on us, which will be playing itself, itself out for a couple of years to come. All right. uh, do you care to... Uh, okay. No, absolutely. The health, financial health of the city is, is important, and that's why we need to um, protect our local economy uh, and the residents of the city because ultimately they're the ones that contribute to the city's finances. There is no uh, secret uh, or, uh, or unknown contributor to the, to the city's finances. It's people. It's people who live here, people that we should look out for. It's small businesses. Um, it's, it's employees of those small businesses that contribute to the financial health of the city and that's why those residents uh, and uh, business operators are my priority. All right. Uh, thank you to both of you. I know you've had uh, many questions on many different topics, and you had the opportunity with the last question to pick out the uh, uh, focus, the problem, the major problem of the city, and I believe you have addressed it. Uh, and so now we will move to uh, closing remarks and you will each uh, be given uh, uh, three minutes uh, for your uh, closing remarks. And um, uh, the person who will go first 
is Mr. Tornick. Okay. Uh, thank you all for those of you that have managed to get through this, even with the uh, challenges that I guess we've had electronically. And thank you to the sponsors again for hosting this. I think it's a great opportunity for people to uh, not just assess the candidates, but to get informed about, um, about important issues uh, in the city and what other people consider to be most important. Um, my practice in terms of, of how I try to serve as your mayor has been to listen carefully to what uh, people have to say uh, and what the staff has to say in terms of their uh, reaction to uh, requirements we impose upon them. Then to study the issue as carefully as I can to gain as much information as I, as I can. And I, I don't think there's um, anybody that outworks me in terms of trying to study an issue and become as informed as I can be on it. Then tell the truth, um, tell the people directly uh, what my thinking is on it and, um, and then deliver, make it happen. Um, I think people expect the truth and uh, demand it and want to hear it not in a kind of a couched way or what they call a political way, uh, but to hear it as, as straight talk. Um, that doesn't help me with, with some people, but I think for the most part people appreciate it. Um, I think that it's been suggested that somehow um, that kind of straight talk and the um, is not collegial and doesn't uh, comport with the, the Pasadena way of doing business um, in, in a very collegial and uh, polite uh, format. Um, I would suggest that while my way may be a little bit more uh, direct and blunt than, than some may be comfortable with, that in fact on the three most challenging issues, the most controversial and complicated issues that have confronted uh, the council during the course of, of my being mayor, uh, the minimum wage, the Measure I, the decision to launch Measure I and Measure J, and the police oversight uh, process, that um, the council has delivered unanimous decisions on all those, good decisions that were done unanimously. And I think that that would tend to belie the idea that somehow uh, I'm uh, operating in a, in a uh, uh, autocratic or non-collegial way. I hope that, um, that you will understand that the challenges facing the city going forward are significant. I certainly do. I think I have a proven track record of success uh, during my service on the city council uh, and as planning director and as uh, now as mayor for the past five years. And I hope that you will give me the opportunity to continue that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Mr. Gordo. True, truth and directness is important, and, and I have joined in that. Uh, very direct and, and very uh, and made, made my opinion known well in all of these public debates and, and would like to believe that had a hand in persuading people uh, in all, on all of those issues. The minimum wage issue came to EdTech and uh, I managed that discussion. Uh, Measure I and J, um, you know, no one member of the council deserves credit. Um, in fact, I raised uh, the bulk of the money quietly to ensure that that measure passed. And, and um, Mayor Tor Tornick asked me to do that and I did it. Uh, and education, all of these issues. Um, and so I want to thank everyone for participating, for looking closely at the issues. And let me again thank everyone who voted in the primary uh, and expressed uh, citywide confidence and support uh, in my, in my uh, campaign for mayor. I'm running to represent all of the residents of this city, continue what I've always done, listen carefully as I have, and bring us together to work towards sensible decisions as I have for almost 20 years. That's why I'm supported by former mayors, by a council member elect, by the most senior member of the city council, um, by former superintendent of schools, uh, Vera Vignes, Vignes. And I think the primary results uh, show that across the board, um, there is citywide support. Uh, and I appreciate that for my candidacy and I appreciate that very much. I will work very hard to bring us together. So we're working as neighbors um, uh, to address the ongoing COVID crisis, to address the economy, during COVID, post-COVID, 
to address the issue of development, affordable housing, uh, to push back against Sacramento. Uh, as a product of the Pasadena Unified School District, uh, whose wife is a public school teacher, I can assure you there will be no stronger advocate for our schools. Uh, you trust, you, you can trust me uh, and know that uh, I'll never pre-bake decisions and then offer the my way or the highway attitude. Uh, I, I believe strongly pass in Pasadena uh, as a place where we live, not an urban planning exercise for me. Uh, my approach uh, will never be that I know better than everyone else. My approach will be as it has been um, to believe uh, in the people of this city. I'm asking to be our next mayor because I care for, love, and believe in the wisdom of the people of this city. Uh, and I will be the, a mayor uh, who uh, will represent all of the people in this city um, and always act in the best interest uh, of the people of this city. Uh, and I thank everyone for your consideration uh, for me to be our next mayor. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, thank you to, uh, to both of you uh, for an interesting uh, evening. I hope that the public who have listened have learned more about uh, your views and your policies uh, and how you, in fact, will lead Pasadena as its next mayor. Uh, so I thank the uh, people attending on the webinar for taking the time to be part of the forum. Uh, as stated earlier, the League's Voter Services is to promote an informed and involved electorate. We hope that we have succeeded in helping you become better, better informed about your choices in this election. But now we have to turn things over to you for the involved part. Please participate in our democracy by casting your vote on, on by mail or at a vote center and urge your friends and family to do the same. If you contact three friends and they contact three friends and they contact three friends and you can continue this yourself, we will have many more people voting in this election. So we all need to take responsibility. It is a critical election in our country, and I encourage all of you uh, to do all you can to not only vote yourselves, but to get everyone you come in contact with uh, who is eligible to vote. And by the way, the deadline for registering to vote is October the 19th. If one has missed that date, they can, uh, they can register to vote at a vote center uh, on election day uh, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, mail-in ballots will start coming out on October the 5th and uh, they will uh, be coming in, uh, in a rotating fashion, uh, but the 5th is the first date, so look for your mail-in ballot, be informed, and then uh, you will also find out on October the 5th uh, where your drop boxes are in each of the cities. And of course, you can also go and vote uh, in the post office, drop your mail-in ballot off in the post office. So the League of Women Voters uh, encourages all to vote and all to get all of their friends and families to vote as well. And with that, I'll call this uh, forum to a close. Thank you very much.